Welcome to the Red and Bold Show. I am one of your hosts, Mark Adams of 49ers Camelot. This is Anthony Robertson of 49ers Cutback. And we are thrilled to have you with us today to talk 49ers draft. We're going to focus a little bit on the defense today. Going to have a good time. So thanks for joining us. Make sure that you stay here with us throughout the whole thing. And uh, while you're at it, not right now while we're talking, but once we're finished, Make sure that you go to both YouTube channels and subscribe if you haven't already. You'll see them right there, 49ers Camelot, 49ers Cutback. Just go on and check us out. And what's up, man? Uh, not a lot. Uh, just excited for the draft. I've been consistently looking at more prospects. Yesterday I put out a video about cornerback prospects, and it just seems like there is a wealth of talent in this draft. And the 49ers are going to get some really good players to add to their pretty good roster already. So I'm excited about the draft. I think it's going to be fun. I think it is going to be interesting to see what the 49ers do, especially with, you know, some of the things that Peter Schrager has come out and said about drafting a wide receiver at 31. I don't know. The 49ers are full of stories. And I think that's what we're going to get when we get to the draft, just a bunch of stories and maybe even some, what, what is going on moments from the 49ers that seems to happen every single year at this point. <laughs> yeah. They do not lack for storylines. That's for sure. Which makes things great for us, whether you're a content creator doing podcasts or whether you're a writer, uh, doesn't matter. They do, uh, they do us all a favor by making sure that they stay in the news. Uh, I've got some people in here in the chat. Uh, what's up JD? What's up Josh? Good to see y'all. Um, let's uh, let's start off with this. We're going to talk some draft here in a minute, but uh, the 49ers announced yesterday that they're bringing back one of their old slot receivers, Trent Taylor. Now, I think that he has had uh, like eight catches. I think I I think that's what I heard over the last few years. So I don't think he's coming in to. Uh, take Juwan Jennings' place or anything like that. He's likely coming in to be an option for punt return. What do you think about the signing? What do you think about Trent Taylor as a punt returner? Uh, he's, he's done that before. He's more sure-handed than, than somebody like Ronnie Bell. He's not going to break any, uh, but uh, in, in, you know, for me, the number one job for a punt returner is don't turn the ball over. If Trent Taylor had been back there in the Super Bowl. Who knows what would have happened? But what did you think of the news yesterday when it came down? Yeah, I was a little surprised. Uh, right off the bat, I didn't think this signing was going to happen. I never thought a reunion was really on the horizon, but it makes sense. You want to make sure you fill roster spots so you don't have to draft a particular position, and that's what the 49ers consistently do. So now they're not beholden to drafting a wide receiver that has the ability to return punts. They have a veteran that they already know who he is, what he's about. And the fact that if he does make your 53 man roster, not only can he handle punt return duties, but you know, if you put him out there, he can block. And uh, that's something that's very important to Kyle Shanahan. And that's one of the question marks with Danny Gray, with Ronnie Bell is how well are they going to block? So now Ronnie Bell is put on notice. Danny Gray's put on notice. We have veteran players that we feel comfortable with that are going to come out here and work. And if you're not ready to work and work hard, we're going to go with a veteran option that we are very comfortable with because he was one of our guys. We drafted him. So I think this was a solid move. We know Trent Taylor is a solid guy, and he's a guy that comes in and competes. Do I think he's ever going to reclaim what he did in his rookie season? I don't think so. But I don't think that's why the 49ers are bringing him here. And uh, for the role that they've got him for, you know, placed into, I think he'll do just fine. I think the 49ers uh, are going to feel comfortable now at their wide receiver position. Now they don't have to dra draft a wide receiver, even though Malachi Corley just came in for a 30 visit, uh, thanks to Jordan Schultz reporting that. So they're still looking at wide receiver in the top of this draft. Bryant Culp, what's up, man? He's in here with us. Uh, David's in here. Uh, sounds like most um everybody that's commented so far likes the signing as a punt returner um let's see josh said danny and ronnie can't block to save their lives yeah i was going to ask you about that um of course um 
uh, Trent Taylor was drafted in the same draft in the same round as uh, George Kittle. And like you mentioned, he had a good rookie season as pass catcher, especially once uh, Jimmy Garoppolo came uh, onto the team. But you you mentioned something about him blocking. Are you talking in the run game that, that that's where he's a good blocker? Yeah, he's good in all aspects. Uh, that's one thing you know. He knows where he's supposed to be and when he's supposed to be there. And he does a good job once he makes initial contact about latching on and being able to sustain blocks. That's the problem for Ronnie Bell. That's the problem for Danny Gray. They make contact. They know where they're supposed to be. They just don't execute the block, and that's huge. That's the difference between McCaffrey reeling off a five-yard run and potentially a 12-yard run. It changes drives. It changes momentum. So the 49ers saw that last year. That's why they brought Chris Conley in for the playoffs and made him a part of the active roster. They knew they needed that big physical receiver that could handle blocking the occasional catch. But really, that's what it's about. It's about blocking and allowing Christian McCaffrey to get those big yards because this is still a run first team. So having a guy that can do it is important. And the young guys just haven't been able to figure it out. Ronnie Bell, I, I know he's not a small guy, but he plays like a small guy when he's blocking. And I think that's one of the big question marks. And Trent, uh, Trent Taylor helps kind of eliminate some of those question marks about the wide receiver position, at least five deep. Yeah, and you know, whenever you see a lot of runs, like in the running game, that are those chunk yardage runs, you're going to find wide receivers who block well in the run game and who block well down the field. The 49ers need those chunk plays, just like every offense does, because it's harder and harder these days to meticulously move the ball down the field. Those 10 play drives that uh, everybody talks about, those are getting harder because turnovers happen, penalties happen, and so you have those drive killers that you need those chunk yards so that you don't have to go double-digit type drives uh, where something bad um, could happen. So uh, interesting move. Um, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe they'll draft somebody that will end up being uh, the punt returner over Trent Taylor. He may not even make it to uh, the, the regular season. Uh, just kind of depends. But at least we know that there's a reliable punt returner who's not going to be muffing a lot of punts out there. So uh, let's, t let's turn our attention to the draft, specifically the uh, defense. Uh, as we see some other people uh, jumping in here, uh, David, what's up, man? Thanks for joining us. And uh, Mike, appreciate it. Mr. Corey, uh, thanks uh, thanks all of y'all for joining us today. So let's talk uh, defense and the draft. Is there any way that the 49ers take a defensive tackle at the end of round one they like their defensive tackles. They like them in the first round. Is there any way that they do that again if the right person drops? And if so, who do you think that might be? Yeah, there is a possibility. And, you know, Jordan Schultz has been doing a good job, and he always reaches out to me and, and sends me stuff when he's about to make a post, and I appreciate that. And one thing that he put out was the 49ers were in person just a couple days ago to watch Johnny Newton work out. Uh, Johnny Newton's a big defensive tackle out of Illinois, and he is a fun player. And there's two real defensive tackles in the first round. And Johnny Newton's one of them, and then also Byron uh, Young from Texas. Both of those guys are options if they happen to slide. These guys should be top 20 picks, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen because this is a quarterback, offensive tackle, wide receiver, and cornerback first round. Uh, they're expecting more offensive players to go in this first round than ever before. And so hmm. that means a defensive lineman could potentially fall. These guys have a lot of skills. And you might ask the question, why would the 49ers look at defensive line in the first round? Well, you want to consistently build. And they have some short-term options. I think they've got good players right now. But if you could upgrade your depth even by getting one of these guys with the way the 49ers play a full rotation, and all of a sudden, Johnny Newton is playing consistent snaps for your football team. Not only does that make you better this year, that will make you better next year and for years to come. 
where you could replace guys as they start to move on. Javon Hargrave getting older. Uh, you mm -hmm. don't know what's going to happen with Malik Collins after this season. No guaranteed money next year. So defensive tackle is a real option. And I think the 49ers know that if somebody falls there, they're going to have to make a decision. So defensive tackle Byron Young and uh, Johnny Newton are both guys I think the 49ers could be interested in. Both of them are very explosive. Uh, they can make things happen. They blow up double teams. Newton is a guy that's about 305 pounds, but plays like he's 335 pounds. I mean, the dude's an absolute monster. Uh, so those two guys would definitely be in play at 31 if they were available. Yeah, Newton's the one in particular that I was thinking of uh, because he is pretty explosive. Josh said defensive line is going to be the pick for sure. And uh, he noted that there's not been a defensive tackle taken the past two seasons besides Kalia Davis. And, of course, Kalia Davis we know has been injured. He's barely played uh, for the 49ers because of that. So uh, if, if the 49ers draft an edge rusher, we talked about this just real briefly last week, if they take a, an edge rusher at the end of the first round, who do you think that might be? Like, are, are there some names that have some jump that that have jumped out to you? Whether it's somebody that they've met with, or just somebody that you really like that you think might be a good fit. I love the the top three edge rushers in this draft. Uh, Jared Verse is my favorite. Of course, I'm a Florida State fan, and he comes from Florida State, so I've watched him play a ton. But he's a mixture of speed and power. The problem is he's going to go in the top 15 picks. If he falls, I would be really shocked. I mean, the dude is a generational type talent. You have Latu out of UCLA. Uh, he's very talented, probably going in the top 20. You have also Dallas Turner going in the top 20. So those guys are probably out of the reach of the 49ers. So I don't think they're real options. So then the question is, where do you see Chop Robinson? Chop Robinson's a guy with a good first step, a guy that can get around the edge, has all the intangibles, speed, and everything that you're looking for athletically. But production-wise, three sacks in his senior year, Adisa Isaac on the opposite side had a lot more production. So the question is, is Chop Robinson really a first-round talent? I don't know if he even gets to 31 either. The way he's been moving up the board because of his athletic profile, he met with Philadelphia this week. I don't even know if he's available. So I'm not sure there's going to be a legit first-round talent available for the 49ers at 31. I think when it comes to 31, there just might not be a guy there. Now, if somebody gets within five spots of the 49ers of those top three defensive ends and they're available, I think you trade up and you go get one. I think that these guys are very talented and you put them opposite of Bosa right away. They really help your defense the way you go through a rotation, but then eventually them and Bosa together uh, would just make a lot of sense for the 49ers. So I do like guys at the, edge position in the first round. I just don't think any of the ones that are first round talents are going to be available at 31. Yeah, that's definitely the concern. And so uh, we'll see. Uh, Mr. Corey asked, have you guys heard of us trying to trade into the teens? I have not heard that, but I don't think that you would. They may be in talks, but the 49ers do a good job for the most part of hiding what they're going to do. So, yes, they typically draft players that they meet with or that they bring in. Um, so they're not they're not really hi uh, hiding that. But when it comes to trades and things like that, all, all you have to do is go back to the DeForest Buckner trade. That came out of nowhere. Go back to the trade uh, that they made with Miami to move up in the draft in 2021 to get Trey Lance. Out of nowhere, that came. So... I haven't heard anything like that, but I also wouldn't expect to uh, to hear anything about that. I, I'm, I'm assuming you haven't either. No, I, I did hear that there were phone conversations, but to, you know, just full transparency, every single team does that before the, the draft even starts. They call up other teams, see about the possibility of what it would cost to move up into their position you try to get an idea of what positions they're targeting so you have conversations, but you want to set a basis so that way you understand what it would take to move up if one of those players you really like does go ahead and start slipping. So everyone does this. Everyone gets a baseline for what it's going to take with each team and whether 
You could have a working relationship with them in the draft, but it doesn't mean they're going to trade up. It just means they're doing due diligence and what you're supposed to do. You also do that about trading back. Hey, if one of your players are there, Carolina, would you maybe like to come up? And you start having those conversations now because when you get to draft day, you don't have much time to make that decision. So conversations happen all the time. They've started all the way at the combine. They'll continue all the way until the draft happens. Yeah. Uh, Lou's in the chat and said, great show, guy. Uh, thanks, guys. I'm late for the show. But, Ant, do you see them going after Sweat for the D-line? You know, Sweat's an interesting prospect because uh, he's massive. I mean, the guy is 360 pounds. He, he moves people all over the place. He's an absolute beast. The problem is, just a couple weeks ago, he got a DWI. Uh, so now he's got a, a mark that the 49ers don't like to deal with. Now, of course, mm -hmm. you can learn a lot about character, but he's a well-known guy around Texas as far as partying. Anyone, I have family in Texas. Anyone knows he's a, a guy that's a, a partier. So I think the 49ers would probably shy away from him, even though he's a tremendous talent. I think he's on a fall. There were a lot of people that saw him as a fringe first rounder that are now talking about him being a late day two pick. I think a lot of it has to go with char character concerns. And we know the 49ers don't love character concerns, especially after what happened with Ruben Foster. So I would think Sweat, maybe if it was just too rich for their blood late in the third round, something like that, that would make sense. Uh, but I would probably guess the 49ers steer clear of a character concern like Sweat. What did you think about the Ruben Foster uh, pick back in, what was that, 2017, wasn't it? Um, what do yeah. you think about that? Because I, I'll confess that when it happened or, or when they traded back up into the first round, I was, I was like, Reuben Foster, come on, pick Reuben Foster. And then they did. And I was pretty excited, uh, cause I thought he was going to be really good, but he just had so many other issues going on. Did you like that pick or did you hate it? Uh, how'd you feel about that? No, I loved it. I wanted Reuben Foster in that draft and I thought he was a top 10 pick. So when he slid all the way down to the end of the first round and the 49ers jumped up, I was excited because I saw, oh, wait, we got another Navarro Bowman. We got another Patrick Willis. I mean, the way that he played, he plays like his hair's on fire, and he's playing out there in the UFL, and he still plays the same way. His problem was uh, off the field, and, and those issues we can not really know a lot about. I mean, that's one of the tough things for us. We're not as privy to the information, the background checks, the medical and all that, but yeah, I was really excited like you. I thought, oh man, we got ourselves a guy in Reuben Foster. It's too bad that it didn't work out. Yeah, Josh said Saban lied to us, and that's why we don't draft uh, Alabama players anymore. Yeah, those coaches are always going to prop up their guys. I, I mean, I don't know what that where that fine line is that I want to tell the truth about a guy that maybe I have some concerns about, but at the same time, if I have another guy go in the first round, that's going to help me when I'm out recruiting to be able to say, Hey, look at, look at all these guys going in the first round. So uh, those coaches, <laughs> they definitely um, like to prop up their guys. Mr. Corey said Foster couldn't stay healthy. Yeah. That's uh, part of his issue. Um, and then that, <laughs> that, whatever that girl was that he was dating, but, uh, oh, yeah. and Mr. Corey said we drafted that scrub Cameron Latu. Hey, maybe, maybe Latu becomes a stud this year instead of a scrub. Uh, we'll have to see, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that it's interesting to look back. Uh, Lou said, since we're going back in time, what the hell did the 49ers ever see in a tweener like Solomon Thomas don't know. Uh, I did uh, over the weekend. I did. I wrote an article for 49ers Web Zone on my the. I think it was like the five or six. I can't. I don't remember the number now. Like the five or six worst picks uh, in 49ers history. First worst first round picks, and uh, I didn't have Reuben Foster on there. I didn't have Solomon Thomas. I thought about putting him on there simply because they passed on Mahomes. But uh, I decided just to go with more guys um, like what Josh said here, A.J. Jenkins. He was on there because he had one catch in his 49ers career. In fact, or he may not even have any. Uh, I, I kind of yeah, think that he had, had Yeah, he may not have. Um, and, and so there were other ones like that, you know, like uh, Reggie McGrew and Kentuan Balmer, who these guys did nothing. 
And so, um, you know, that, uh, that was kind of an interesting thing to look back on. Uh, but, uh, um, how about at corner? If the 49ers take a corner, if they stay at 31 and take a corner, what um, what do you think they might do? There, or, or is there a certain person that you think that they might target? I, I think there's a couple guys that could be available at 31. Uh, I think Cooper DeJean out of Iowa. Uh, to me, this guy is the complete package. Now that he did his pro day and he ran his 4-4, uh, he jumped out of the building. He showed the elite athleticism. Uh, he's just an absolute stud. And I know a lot of teams see him as a safety. Some see him as a corner. I think he slides in day one as a nickel corner for the 49ers and could start keeping Diameter Lenore on the outside. And I think with the way that teams are playing so much nickel, I think nickel's now the base package. That's how you have to build your team. If you're going to play a certain package 70 to 75% of the time, that's your base. It's no longer the 4-3. I don't know why we call it that anymore. Uh, so I think Cooper Jean would make a lot of sense playing the nickel for the 49ers. Elite athleticism can change direction on a dime. Very good physical at the point of attack as far as tackling could fit in very nice with the 49ers system. I think he would be a prime pick. And then the other one I really like at 31, he would be more of an outside corner is Kool-Aid McKinnistry out of Alabama. We know Josh said no Alabama players, but when you watch <laughs> Kool-Aid, he's a guy that was tested very much because Terry on Arnold, who's a top cornerback in this draft, didn't get as much attention. They didn't throw his way because he's so good. So Kool-Aid got all the work, and he did a very good job. Now, the question marks about Kool-Aid and why he's not a top tw- That could concern the 49ers. That could concern a lot of teams potentially to not bring him in. So uh, to me, this is one of those ones that are interesting for the 49ers, and uh, we'll see what happens. But I think Kool-Aid, McKinnistry, Cooper, John make a lot of sense at 31 other than that, I'm not sure there's a player I really like at that position, or at least I don't know the 49ers would like. I like Kamari Lasseter from Georgia. I think he would be a great pick at 31, uh, but I'm one of the few that like him that much. But I think he has versatility to play out and inside. Are there any positions on defense that you can't see the 49ers taken in round one? Yeah, there's a couple. Number one, safety. Uh, there's not enough value for a safety. Plus, I don't have any safety with a first-round grade. So to me, that wouldn't make any sense. That's why I think some teams are going to pass on Cooper DeJean. If they see him as a safety, uh, they're going to pass on him. So I don't think safety is an option. I don't think linebacker is an option either. I think everything else is probably on the board. Uh, probably not guard either. Uh, but defensively, we're just sticking on defense. I think it's that linebacker and safety. Yeah, that those were the exact two that I I was thinking because I think that defensive tackle, I think that edge, I think corner are all uh, genuine real possibilities um, at number thirty one. So if the forty nine, we're, uh, we're talking a week from tomorrow, so uh, the draft is coming quickly, and uh, next week. Uh, we can, there, there were some people requesting a mock draft. We could do something like that. If you want, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that, but what are the 49ers most likely going to do a week from tomorrow? Are they most likely to trade up for an offensive tackle? Are they most likely to stay at 31 and take a corner or stay at 31 and take an edge rusher? And you we could even throw in a fourth one, um, trade up for an edge rusher. Yeah, you know, it's it's going to be interesting. I, I don't know how much it's going to cost to get up to where you could get one of those good offensive tackles. I think those guys are going to be very premium picks. So I look for some teams that are probably, you know, in the early 20s to want to move up and potentially secure one of those offensive tackles. So I don't know if the 49ers got enough juice to be able to move up into, you know, the top 20 picks and be able to get the tackle that they're really looking for. And I do think that they feel pretty confident with the offensive line that they have. Whether we like it or not, that's how the 49ers feel. So I think that that's probably the least likely of the options is trading up to get an offensive lineman. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think that they're going to go too early. When it comes to edge rush, I think it would have to be a very slight trade up. It would have to go to the 25 area. Uh, trading up six picks is still a lot of draft capital you have to give up, but uh, for one of those elite guys, I just don't know if there's going to be a guy there. So 
Uh, just by process of elimination, I think it's more likely the 49ers are at 31 and take a corner than the other options that you provided. I actually believe the most likely scenario for the 49ers is to trade back into the second round and not make a pick on day one with somebody coming up to get a quarterback at the end of round one to get that fifth year option available, you know, ability on a quarterback. That makes the most sense for me. I can see the 49ers going back to 33 through 35, picking up an extra draft pick or two that they could use to maneuver to get a couple of guys in the second round. I think that could be a way that the 49ers go ahead and get guys because the guys that they're really meeting with are going to be right in the midst of the top 50 picks. And so I think that there's probably a way the 49ers could take 63 and whatever they use to trade back to move up into the top 50 and get two top 50 guys. Uh, so I think that might be something the 49ers look to do in the draft. What about Roger Rosengarten? Because John Lynch and Chris Forrester were in Seattle on Saturday uh, for the Washington uh, Huskies Pro Day. And uh, there was a report that they spent some time with Rosengarten. What do you think of him? Do you think that he's going to make it? Is I, I know that he's raw, uh, that he hasn't played much. Maybe he's like the Trey Lance of offensive linemen. But what do you think of him? Fastest offensive lineman in the draft. Uh, moves well. He's played. Uh, he played in high school for uh, Ed McCaffrey, so he's familiar with this zone run scheme. Uh, probably already knows this offense. I, I would say a, a, at least some. So, what do you think of him? Is that is is he a first round guy, or or do you think he's going to be more of second or later? Yeah, I don't think he's a first-round guy. I think he would be a reach at 31. All the more reason why I think a trade back makes a lot of sense. Get those top 50 picks, maybe get Malachi Corley, a wide receiver, and get Roger Rosengarten with those top 50 picks. That makes a lot of sense, kind of a two-for-one type thing. Uh, Rosengarten and the fact that they went to work him out doesn't surprise me. He fits the athletic profile for what they're looking for. It's funny because he very much reminds me of Colton McKivitz as far as he's a better pass blocker, like Josh said, than a run blocker. He has the athleticism and more athleticism than Colton McKivitz, though. He could get to the second level like Mike McGlinchey, but Mike McGlinchey was an actual bulldog when he blocked in the run game where you didn't, you don't get that from Rosengarten. You don't get that from Colton McKivitz. So uh, I think he would be a developmental talent. It kind of shows a little bit of shift in the way the 49ers go about their business as far as drafting guys who are better pass protectors, who they think they can develop in the run game instead of the opposite, what they used to do, get guys who are better in the run game they thought they could develop in the passing game. So I like Rosengarten. I wouldn't mind him at 63. I wouldn't mind them trading in the top 50, 45 to 50 to go ahead and get him. I think there would be good value there. But 31 would be a little rich for my blood considering the amount of talent that they have on the football team the fact that Rosengarden wouldn't help the 49ers in 2024. Yeah, Lou says he's a third round guy. Um, and as David said, uh, love that he's training with old number 74. Uh, that, of course, is Joe Staley. So, yeah, good, uh, good guys there. So, here's a, a question from David that I wanted to get to. Um, if he could get a top 10 pick this year for Ayuk, do you think the Niners would consider it? I think they would. I, I think a top 10 pick for Brandon and I, you could be tremendous value. That's more value than, you know, you, the Titans got for AJ Brown. That's a lot of, you know, a lot of talent that's in that top 10. You could potentially get Joe Alt, the best tackle in this draft. I mean, you could for sure get your tackle of the future. You could probably get one of those top three edge rushers. You, you know, you're going to have a lot of talent there. So you don't want to do player for player. So you wouldn't want to potentially take a wide receiver. We know what kind of pressure that put on Javon Kinlaw being the guy that was going to one for one uh, with Buckner. So to me, yes, top 10, you definitely think about it. That's tremendous value. Being able to pick at 10 and, or, you know, nine, potentially if the bears, that's the one I've heard uh, nine and 31 would give you two very, very good football players. I think you think about it. The question is, it, whoever you get in the top 10, are they going to help you win the Super Bowl in 2024? Because we know Brandon Ayuk is. That's the big yeah. question. And I think that's where you have to kind of weigh the future versus 
the right now? Yeah, I think that they will um, consider anything. Would they pull the trigger on a trade that gets them into the top 10? Yeah, they might. I, I mean, like you said, that's really good value. And so it is possible that they would. Um, but I, I kind of think that they're just, I mean, there was a report yesterday that the 49ers have been telling people who are who are calling about trading for Ayuk that they've been saying no. So I don't know if that's it's it's hard to say this is the season of lying. So you don't know what is really happening, what's really being said. The reports, a lot of them are rumors, some of it is speculation, some of it is legit. And so you just kind of have to take everything this time of year with a grain of salt and then just kind of see what happens. But I think that uh, I, I kind of agree with Mr. Corey here. Trading Ayuk is punning on the 2024 season. Yeah, like who are they going to replace him with unless they grab somebody in the top 10? But if they trade all the way up, I don't know if it's for a receiver. I think that like like what you mentioned, it it's probably for a tackle. And so who's going to replace Ayuk, if you trade him, which I just don't think is going to happen. No, even if you got one of the top wide receivers, we haven't seen a top wide receiver, or, you know, or a guy that comes in as a rookie, including Brandon Ayuk, be able to transition right into Kyle Shanahan's system. So thinking you're going to get even close to the production you get from Ayuk uh, would just be unserious. I mean, no one can actually think that. So to me, I don't think this is a real option. I haven't thought Brandon Ayuk being traded is a real option. I think a top 10 pick, you have to think about it. But ultimately, I don't think anyone's going to offer a top 10 pick, and I don't think the 49ers are going to trade Brandon Ayuk. I think Ayuk's going to be here at least for the 2024 season as the 49ers try to go out there and win a Super Bowl. Yeah, I'm with David. All pro re wide receivers don't grow on trees. Keep them. Josh said he's the best blocking wide receiver in the league as well. Actually, I think his teammate is the best blocking wide receiver, Juwan Jennings, but Ayuk is probably the second best. Uh, but like you said, man, Kyle's hard on receivers, especially young ones. Debo seemed, uh, Debo's like the golden child. He just seems to be like Kyle's favorite kid, you know? Um, but Ayuk had, he had it tough his first year and a half really um Trent Taylor had a good rookie season but I mean you go back to Dante Pettis and Ronnie Bell and some of these other guys and uh he he just he's hard on these guys he demands a lot from them and so like you said rookie wide receivers struggle at times in the NFL anyway but especially in uh Kyle's uh offense so Lou said heck guys I'd move Ayuk for the 20th pick Three catches per game in the playoffs were a running team. Yeah, I don't agree with that, Lou. I just, uh, um, I think, you know, and David said, uh, Lou, we passed more in the playoffs than we ran. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, I'm not giving up Ayuk for number 20. I don't even know that I'd give him up for number 10. That Boy, that would be hard. Uh, gosh, yeah, that's a tough one, but... Uh, let me move on to, to, to the next thing. Um, so the 49ers on Monday started their off-season program. Um, here's how this works out. So the first two weeks of an off-season program are just kind of meetings, strength, conditioning, rehab, that kind of thing. Then there's three weeks of on-field workouts. Uh, you can't do live, like, offense versus defense Um uh, you can't, they can't be physical at all. Uh, and that's for three weeks. And the final phase is four weeks of things like OTAs, mini camps. Uh, they can do seven on seven. They can do 11 on 11, but no live contact. I mean, we remember when uh, Diamador Lenore, when the 49ers got in trouble because he posted the video where he was putting his hands on somebody and getting a little too physical. Um, so there are specific things they cannot do and so uh, for the 49ers specifically, offseason, uh, the OTAs are May 20th, 21st, 23rd, 28th, 29th, and 31. The mandatory minicamp is June 4th through the 6th. So I want to ask you, 
what is your favorite part of the off season program? Not the off season as a whole that would include the draft and free agency, but just the off season program. Do you like the the rookie mini camp? Do you like OTAs? Do you like the uh, the mandatory mini camp in June? What's your favorite part of the off season program? I mean, if I was coaching, I would say the beginning because that means you're getting back to work. You're getting guys out on the field. But uh, as a fan, as a as a podcaster, I would say it's probably mini camp. And the reason is it's mandatory. So everyone shows up uh, then there. You know that you're just about to get started on training camp because once they do mini camp, you get the little layoff and then here they come back. So I would say that that's the closest thing you're going to get to real football. Uh, The rest is kind of just going through the motions, installation. They do the same things every single year. So I would say it's probably mini camp for the signal that, hey, we're about to get to the real stuff, which is training camp in July. I always hate that uh, once the mini camp's over and it's a good month and a half before a training camp starts, I always hate that time because it's so slow. Um, Unless you were Jim Harbaugh's 49ers, uh, which – there would be a lot of arrests and things like that. Um, Other than that, it's a pretty slow uh, time. So um, let's see if I got anything else in here in the uh, Josh said rookie mini camp. Um, Mr. Corey asks, is there any chance Nick Zakel can beat out Jake Brindle? I don't think so. I, I think that it's interesting, you know, with Nick Zakel. I think they are tremendously high on him and his ability to transition to center. So far, we haven't seen that happen. And now they've got Ben Barch as well. That's a very Nick Zakel type player. Two very versatile guys that can play center and guard. And I know that Chris Furster is very high on Barch. So the rubber might meet the road this year for Nick Zakel and Ben Barch. One of them may be on this roster and one may not especially with the fact that Spencer Burford's probably going to be a backup and we know they really like him. So it's going to be hard to make the 49ers offensive line. That's why I think it's interesting. You know, a lot of people are mocking multiple offensive linemen and me included a lot of times because you see needs, but they don't really have a lot of position where they can put guys at. So you're talking about potentially guys coming in, beating out Jalen Moore or beating out others as in backup roles. Uh, so to me, it's going to be interesting. I don't know what's going to happen with Nick Zakel and Ben Barch, but I think that's going to be a training camp battle to watch. And let's see if Zakel or Barch can take a step forward and be that number one backup center, uh, because it looks like now you're going to have Feliciano playing more guard. And last year he did both both roles. Yeah, I I agree. I, I don't think that Zakel is going to beat out anybody, um, especially Brendel, who um, Chris Forrester really likes. And Kyle Shanahan evidently really likes as well uh, because, gosh, I, I don't remember when this was, but Kyle said something like um, how Forrester had said, hey, we've got to go get Brendel. And he said something to the effect of, now that I've seen him, he's better than advertised. So I think that they like him. And I don't think uh, I don't think that Nick Zakel is going to uh, uh, beat out uh, Jake Brendel. Mr. Corey said no chance Kyle starts a rookie center. A lot of people want Zach Frazier. Completely agree. He's I don't know if Kyle's ever had a rookie. He's had rookie tackles. He's had rookie guards, but I don't ever remember him having a rookie center. Yeah, I I know a lot of people talk about you know Powers Johnson. They talk about Zach Frazier. They're both very good players and would be eventual starters in this league. And for some teams, they might start. I just don't think handling protections the way that Kyle Shannon has his center handle protections, that that is a realistic option for 2024. I think both guys would be great selections for 2025, 2026, as far as starting centers for the 49ers. But helping the 49ers in 2024, I don't see it. Uh, That's why I don't put as much value on those guys. A lot of people really like them. But the 49ers, remember, do not usually draft interior offensive linemen in the top parts of the draft. Aaron Banks is the only one that's an interior offensive lineman that they've drafted, and it's been in the second round. And I'm not even sure that was their number one target. I'm pretty sure they were targeting Walker Little from Stanford that year, and he got got taken by Jacksonville just ahead, another tackle that would have moved inside. 
So I don't think that they've consistently wanted to go into your offensive line. They like drafting tackles of the most athletic players in college and then moving them inside. That's been their way. And I don't know if it changes, but Powers Johnson and, and Frazier are two very good players. The 49ers could go with in the first or second round. I just don't think that uh, it's going to be where it exactly fall for the 49ers in exactly the right spot. So I actually don't think either one of them end up being 49ers. Yeah. And great job. Uh, that's all that I have. Do you have anything else um, before we take off? No, I'm looking forward to the rest of the draft draft prep. I'm going to be going through. So everyone come through the channel and check it out. I'm, I'm going by position by position and breaking down 49ers targets. And, you know, it's we're building to next Thursday and it's going to be a lot of fun. 49ers finally have a first round pick for the first time in a long time. Uh, since, you know, basically 2020 or 2021 when they traded up to get Trey Lance. So we're going to get some sort of fireworks when we get closer to their spot. I'm excited for it. I'm excited for a new day in 49ers. We'll have a lot of content to talk about once they mar start drafting these players. We can get a good idea of how the 49ers feel about their roster, their depth, and where they're moving in the future. And so I'm excited about uh, the draft coming up next week. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll be back next Wednesday at 2 o'clock Pacific time. We're going to try to do some kind of uh, uh, mock draft or something like that. So uh, be sure that you come back uh, this time next week. And uh, as soon as we're finished here, as soon as we say our goodbyes and you wipe away your tears because you're going to miss us that much, as soon as that's all finished, Go to 49ers Cutback, go to 49ers Camelot, and make sure you subscribe and support uh, what we're doing. We really appreciate that. Uh, that's all that we have. Make sure that you're back here uh, next week. We're going to have a good time preparing uh, that last uh, stream right before the draft. And have a great rest of your week, and everybody else um, do the same thing. You too, Mark.